Now, I often wonder how on earth the city of Birmingham manages to feed itself. And we're talking about a city of over one million people, all of them eating several times every day. When you think about this, this is actually a huge machine bringing food into the city via air and sea freight from across the globe. Then this food moves over land to regional distribution centres, consolidation centres and food hubs. Finally, travelling on to processing units, supermarkets and businesses before any of us ever see it. Most of the food that we will eat next week isn't even in the country yet. Now, I don't know about you, but just thinking about that journey makes me feel quite tired. But it doesn't really make me feel very hungry. Um, DEFRA calculated that in 2002, British food transportation totaled 30 billion kilometres. That's enough to travel all the way around the world 750,000 times. Now that's like almost the entire population of Liverpool all going on around the world trip together. <laughs> it's hard to comprehend this huge daily process, the scale of it, the amount of people involved in it, the agrochemicals, fossil fuels, all involved in getting our food from the field to our fork over and over again every day. It's resulted in a lack of understanding of the provenance of our food, a huge, huge reliance on supermarkets and chemical inputs, and ultimately has resulted in a sort of lowering, really, of the nutritional value of our food. I think this quote from Carolyn Steele from her book, Hungry City, sums it up quite well. Food is the most devalued commodity in the industrial West. Living in cities, we have learnt to behave as if we did not belong to the natural world. We forget that we are animals bound to the land. Our current industrial and agricultural systems are hugely intensive, relying on cheap oil for every stage of production and distribution. These systems, as we know, are greatly damaging to our planet, creating problems including methane emissions from livestock, deforestation and nitrous oxide releases from fertilisers. Agricultural processes comprise 54% of methane emissions, roughly 80% of nitrous oxide emissions and virtually all carbon dioxide emissions linked to land use. Now we all know that climate change is becoming a very real problem for people and wildlife across the globe and how we grow our food more sustainably is a hugely important challenge for this generation. By 1950, 79% of people lived in a city. Now by 2050, this is expected to rise to 92.2% of people. Now in this picture, you can see here, this is a mural um, at King Standing Leisure Centre. It was painted sometime in the 50s when the Leisure Centre was actually a school. And it depicts a group of boys at the school growing their own vegetables, looking out across the city of Birmingham as it grows ever larger. And I tried to wonder what they might think if they were looking out across Birmingham today as it grows and grows. During the Second World War, thanks in part to the Dig for Victory campaign um, by the Ministry of Agriculture, over one million tonnes of fruit and vegetables had been grown in gardens and allotments across the country by 1943. Now, currently in the UK, half of the vegetables and over 95% of all the fruit that we consume comes from overseas. Now, when you think that there are over 3,000 varieties of apples that can be grown in the UK, and over 70% of all land in the UK is actually farmland, this is quite incredible. So, with over 1 million people living in Birmingham, and this figure ever increasing, how on earth are we going to sustainably feed all of them? So personally, when I start to think about this challenge, I like to draw inspiration from the forest. Now this might sound a bit weird, but bear with me for a moment. Um, the forest is an amazing self-sustaining system. You don't need to go into the forest and sow seeds, throw chemicals about, pull up the weeds. The system of a forest just looks after itself. It cares for itself. It's alive from the top layer of tall trees, through to the shrub layer, right down to the mycelium in the soil. Now, nature's systems are designed to work in harmony, perfectly interconnected with everything around them. 
And if we go to the, the forest and observe carefully, I, th I think we can learn quite a lot. This is the idea, really, behind the practical design system that some of you may have heard of called permaculture. And as this quote from... As this quote from Mike Feingold, a permaculture practitioner from Bristol, sums up, permaculture is revolution disguised as gardening. Now, permaculture seeks to create beautiful living systems that provide food and other essentials for people and animals in sustainable ways. And it aims to work with nature rather than against it. It combines age-old indigenous wisdoms, it's not all new, with new insights emerging from movements for sustainability around the world. It's dynamic, it's eclectic, and above all, it's creative. And it's being put into practice to solve some of the greatest problems that the world faces today. It's based on three very simple ethics, and these underpin all permaculture designs and systems. These are earth care, fair share, and people care. Now, when we think back to the current food system that I described at the beginning, we can see that these ethics couldn't really be further from the, the current situation that we have in the food industry. Reliance on fossil fuels, terrible conditions and prices for farmers, and the fact that in 2000, the retailer Walmart had global sales bigger than the gross domestic product of three quarters of the world's economies put together. Now, these certainly don't sound like earth care fair share and people care to me. Now these are huge issues and it's really easy to feel totally overwhelmed and powerless to make any sort of change. However, I like to focus on the permaculture principle, use small and slow solutions. A revolution or change in the way things are done doesn't need to start on a grand scale. It can start from your own backyard or even your front garden and grow from there. So if we begin to look at the city afresh and consider it as a potential edible environment, we, be we can begin to make a change in our own lives and in our communities and have an impact on what we eat. There are lots of spaces that can be utilised to grow food. Even the smaller spaces can be productive with a bit of thought. In many cities around the world, from Cuba to Botswana and in Australia, urban agriculture is seeing a great resurgence. My solution for feeding Birmingham is to turn Birmingham into an edible city. So I want everyone to do a bit of imagining now. Can you imagine strolling down the high street and picking strawberries and apples and raspberries as you go, or perhaps picking and eating some fresh peas on the way to work? Can you imagine walking into your local park and finding a vegetable garden and taking part in caring for that garden and that garden then feeding you? Imagine if everybody had a productive garden, window box, or front garden. Can you really imagine these things happening in Birmingham? Well, it can happen, and it is possible. I'm going to show you some examples of projects I've been involved in, in Birmingham, that have started to create the edible city. So, my um, journey, really, into the edible city first started with small steps into guerrilla gardening. You may have heard of guerrilla gardening. It's the act of taking disused spaces and just planting things in them. You don't ask permission, you just go and do it. But nobody ever really seems to mind. And when you combine this with foraging, which is just finding things that already grow in the city, you quickly find that you start to add and supplement to your diet with some quite interesting things. Wild sorrel, chickweed, rose hips all grow in abundance in the city if you start to look in the cracks in the pavement and in the corners of the parks. In this picture I'm making a wild weed pesto from over 15 different types of edible greens found in the city and it's really delicious. Now I also work quite extensively with schools to create outdoor learning areas for growing, cooking and eating fresh produce. Schools usually have space for at least a small productive vegetable garden and working in them provides a really useful learning environment for the children. It enables children to understand how food grows and starts the process of reconnecting with the land. If all schools grew vegetables in the city, it would encourage the passion for growing your own to start early. This is a school in King Standing that I worked in where I turned 
this small disused area of the field into a productive forest garden filled with fruit and vegetables. And here's some broad beans in flower. Now, it's all very well working in schools. That's great for the school and for the school pupils. But what I really wanted to do was create gardens in the city that were accessible to everybody. Um, gardens that were more visible and public. So in 2010, I set up a project called Edible Erdington. This was an allotment on Erdington High Street, managed by volunteers with produce grown in the huge uh, brick beds that are owned by the council on Erdington High Street. Now, the city council were happy to hand over permission to me to do this, um, but the local people, particularly you can see some of them there, the drinkers from the Swan Pub, if anybody knows Erdington, weren't quite so convinced as me that this was going to work. They liked to tell me over and over again how there was absolutely no point doing a project like this in Erdington because it would all be trashed and destroyed by the kids um, within a few hours. But interestingly, it wasn't trashed, it wasn't destroyed, and that's perhaps one of the best cauliflowers I've ever been involved in growing. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now, interestingly, those drinkers from the Swan started to change their mind about this project, and they actually became staunch defenders of the, the beds of vegetables. They ate a few of the cabbages themselves, which they enjoyed. Um, but they, yeah, they literally had to eat their words, because <laughs> there, they, there they were with the cabbages that they were happy to defend and also eat themselves. So it's a great success. Um, yeah, so here's some sweet corn. You wouldn't think you were on the high street. And some trees that we planted as well. I ran alongside a competition called the Urban Orchard Competition where local people could dedicate a fruit tree to somebody that was important to them. And we planted five fruit trees with plaques along the high street as well to go along with the vegetable beds. So growing projects in the city are not all um, just about the vegetables. They're also about social connections and personal development. In the Roots to Recovery project, I worked with people in residential rehab um, for drug and alcohol addiction to grow fruit and vegetables on disused, a, a disused allotment plot. Um, some allotments do still have spaces available if you look in some of the less affluent areas of the city. Um, now, this project grew absolutely loads of fruit and vegetables and within six months was transformed into this productive plot. And I found that the process of recovery is quite similar to gardening. People and plants need time and nurturing. And in this project, over 80% of service users said that the project helped their recovery. So my journey through the Edible City has followed many paths, trying lots of ways to create connections with the food that already grows here, alongside planting in unusual spaces. Now, fruit has been a large part of the food that I have found growing here. And last year, I set up a social enterprise called Urban Harvest, which finds, picks, and processes surplus fruit from private gardens across the city. Local residents like Mr. Thompson here can become members of the scheme. We pick their surplus fruit, which would otherwise go to waste. It would literally rot on the ground. And we turn it into fruit juice, jams, and pickles which also reconnects with a lot of old skills that are, that are being lost. Um, last season, we picked over five tonnes of fruit. That's about the same weight as three and a half rhinos, for anybody who's interested in rhino weights. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to see the city, really, as kind of a scattered orchard. There's so much fruit out there. And quite a bit of it is thanks to George Cadbury, who made sure that in every house in Bourneville, there were two fruit trees planted in every garden. And a lot of those still exist. some of our jam, and this is our fruit juice, which is the main product that we make. So, my proposal for the next revolution in the city of Birmingham is to help change the city from grey to green. Sow the seeds of change, help make Birmingham an edible city in whatever small way you can. And in the words of Buckminster Fuller, you can never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And always remember, the revolution will not be microwaved. <laughs> Thank you.